And this is a very familiar one. You've learned it probably in Sunday school. You heard it a few times. It's the one where they go on a walkabout, as the people from Australia would say. Um, they march around a city and gave a great shout. If you have a say, amen. And it reads as follows. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Please be seated and pray with me. Father God, we just thank you right now for this opportunity to come before your throne of grace, Lord. We thank you for the fact that you are into construction. You are in the construction business, Lord. You tear down things that need to be torn down. You build things up that need to be built up. You remodel, Lord. You redecorate. You do whatever's necessary. You say in your scripture, you change things. Behold, all things pass away, and behold, all things become new. We become new creatures. So we know you're in the reconstruction business, Lord. We know you are all about remodeling that great makeover. So, Father God, right now, let us look at our hearts. Let us look inside ourselves and see what we need to change within us to be obedient to your word, to be submissive to you, Father God, not to our own pride, but humble ourselves and submit ourselves to your will, to your purpose, to your way, Father God. Right now, Lord, use me as your preacher. Use me, Lord. Let my congregation see and hear you, but make me small. Reduce me, Lord. Humble me, Lord, to use me today as your servant. And Lord, I give thanks in advance for that whosoever want to give their life to Christ or that whosoever want to join your church. Father God, we give thanks and praise to you right now in advance. It's in the mighty name of Jesus. The church said amen. amen. So before I get started, I want to make sure we have a heart of praise. I want to make sure that we have a, 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 a vest, an investment in praise. So I like this side to say glory. glory. Oh, say it like you mean it. Not for me, but for the Lord. Everybody on this side say glory. glory. Everybody on this side say hallelujah. hallelujah. Alright, now keep that spirit. Keep that same spirit. Keep that same spirit. We're going to lift up that verse 20 one more time. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpet. And it came to pass that when the people heard the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, glory. And the people shouted with a great shout. And that the wall fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, they took the city. The people shouted with a great shout. The wall fell down flat. I like to speak from the thought this morning. Wall fall down, go boom. I try to keep it simple. I I, I was I, I, I tell everybody to keep it simple. The wall fall down, go boom. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. oh my neighbor. Oh, have you ever fallen? Go down and go boom? We all seen the commercial. Have you ever fallen and can't get up? And then that poor person is struggling to get up. And then, and I hurts my heart that poor, they show that poor lady there, oh, I've fallen and I can't get up. We're going to see that in today's text, Kevin. The people of Jericho, the people of God, are going to attack the city of Jericho. And Trish, they're going to use unconventional warfare that is going to stun, surprise, and amaze people for centuries to come. The Israelites are going to use something that God has been asking every believer to do for centuries. To have faith, to have trust, to hold on in him in times of need. To trust in God. You see, Ms. Sheila, God is going to use obedience and faith as his weapon of choice for the people of Israel. How is that possible? The people will obey. The people will trust God's word and they will act in faith on God's word. Miss Beverly, looking everyone at verse one and two. Now, Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. 
And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And this is where I'd like you to see my first point. And I would like to give you three for the Trinity to the glory of God. My first point, we see the promised victory. And Israel had to follow divine directions given and take deliberate actions done in faith. We see the promised victory. Israel had to follow the divine directions given and take deliberate actions done in faith. Let's look at the promised victory, verses 1 and 2. Just hold it there for a second. Let everyone write it down. The people of Jericho were terrified of Israel. We learned last week that the people of Jericho had lost all courage. They were scared to death, Sasha, because of the things they heard about God and the things God had done to the enemies of Israel. You see, Brother Paul, Jericho was so scared they went into a lockdown. Looking at verse 1, Jericho was strictly straight shut up, meaning none went out and none came in. The king of Jericho locked the city down because of the children of Israel. They were scared. You see, Ms. Jan, this fear factor was working in favor of Israel. You see, psychological warfare is meant to mentally incapacitate the enemy before they fight. And Brother Dale, based upon the evidence presented here in today's text, the last week's sermon, we see how effective psychological warfare is. You see, Ms. Bev, the enemies of God are so scared to death of Israel and their God. Here's the best part. God had guaranteed victory to Israel. Look at verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given un into thine hand Jericho. That means that's a guaranteed victory. God said it. That settles it. The king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Meaning, I've given you the king. I've given you his mighty men. But I've given you the city of Jericho. God promised Israel victory over the enemies before, watch this, watch this, even before the fight had begun. Meaning, they haven't swung. They haven't thrown a spear. They haven't shot a bow and arrow. God had already promised, guaranteeing victory. Go ahead and give God some glory right there. We call this, brothers and sisters, this is what we call a fixed fight. You see, Miss Pat, this is a fixed fight. Who wouldn't want to serve a God like our God? Who wants to want to serve a God like my God or your God? The hand, he has victory over you even without taking a swing. Now, Miss Pat, I also know of another time there was two fixed fights. There was two of my favorite fixed fights, Job and Jesus. In both cases, the devil lost, and the victory belongs to Jesus. Somebody should have shouted right there. The victory in both those times belongs to Jesus. But let's look at the divine directions. God's detailed instructions on how to fight the enemy. Now, looking at verses 3 through 9. Verse 3. God tells Joshua, your men will walk around the city one time and you'll do it for six days. Verse 4. On the seventh day, seven priests, seven trumpets of ram's horns will walk around seven times and then they'll blow the trumpets. Now, brothers and sisters, it's no coincidence that the number seven is used here. The number seven means completion. So when God was done creating the earth and everything after six days, on the seventh day, God rested. So it's at the end of the seventh day here that they will shout and give victory to God. But look at verse five. When they make that long blast with the ram's horn, you will hear the sound of the trumpet and then all the people will shout a great shout. And watch what the word says up further on. The wall of the city will shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight way before him. Now, God had just gave those directions to Joshua. Now, it's Joshua's responsibility to relay those orders, man, to the people of God. So in verses 6 and 9, Joshua spoke to the priests, spoke to the people, which is the army, and communicated exactly what was to be done in specific detail order. Let me be clear about it. 
There was no variation. There was no change. They did it just the way God had told Joshua to do it, and he did it exactly that way. You see, Geraldine, look at verse 6. Joshua told the priests, take up the ark, let seven priests bear the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. Then in verse 7, he told the army, walk around the city, pass before the ark of the Lord. Then in verses 8 and 9, we see the battle marching order, Miss Lorraine. The people did it as commanded. Notice in all these verses, you read nothing about complaints, nothing about disagreements, nothing about the battle plan. There's no mention of anyone grumbling, Richard, no one complaining, no one criticizing the plan. Matter of fact, no one is saying, this is a crazy idea. He's going to get us killed. No one's sitting around saying anything like that. Matter of fact, everyone did what they were told to do obediently. Miss Latham, they did it obediently without questioning God or Joshua's authority or thinking about the plan. When you get home, read the books of Exodus and Numbers. And throughout each of these books, you'll notice one thing about the parents of these children. All they did, these parents did, was complain constantly, question constantly, and doubted God. Every decision God made, everything that Moses said, they doubted the decision, they questioned every situation, they grumbled and whined, and didn't believe in faith, but doubted God. That's why they died in the desert and had to wander around 40 years as a punishment for their lack of faith. You see, this is what happens when you're a good child. Those children of those disobedient parents saw the results of their lack, their parents' lack of action and faith in God. And we see, look at this text again, we see their deliberate actions in verses 10 through 14. Nancy, verse 10, Joshua commanded the people saying, ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you to shout. Then ye shall do what? Shout. Verse 10, translated loosely, don't say anything. Keep your mouth shut until I tell you what time it is. Verses 11 through 14, the people walked around the city once with the ark, then returned to camp at the end of every day. For six days, they did the same thing every day for six days. They had a parade around Jericho, walking around and then going home. The Bible doesn't say what the people of Jericho thought about what the Israelites did. But just think for a moment. Based upon your knowledge, based upon what you've learned in history when people are under a siege. You see, Dale, conventional military strategy says you need siege towers, battering rams, and wait to start people out of a city under attack. They expected to see flaming arrows flying everywhere. Ladders put up against the wall to storm the walls. But what we see here here, brothers and sisters is this obedient faithful actions that were deliberate nowhere in the verses do you see the people questioning I say that again doubting grumbling arguing or fussing with Joshua they obediently did what they were told to do give God some glory over that we see one thing for sure that they learned from the mistakes their parents had made without question they just did it even though conventional wisdom says you don't take a city by walking around it God told them to walk around once a day keep quiet and they were going to be the first ones and it's the first time in recorded history that you're going to see people do aerobic exercise by getting their steps in and then going back to camp they did it every day for six days and then on the seventh day, they were going to do it seven more times and get more steps in. Oh, I just love that. Your, your health care provider would love to see that you're walking. We serve an unconventional God. How do we know he's unconventional? His ways, the Bible says in Isaiah 55, 8. My ways are, my thoughts are my thoughts, not your thoughts, nor your ways, my ways, says the Lord. Meaning, the way we think, the way we act, and our wisdom has no comparison to God. But here's the best part. So when God wants something done, he 
does it his way to prove to mankind that our way and our thinking is foolish. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, The foolishness of God is wiser than man. The weakness of God is stronger than man. So when we walk around thinking we're smarter than God, that's when we're at our most stupidest. <laughs> God uses unconventional, this unconventional battle plan to prove to Israel, to prove to his enemies, Miss Brooke, that he is the God of heaven, he is the God of earth. Rahab had declared that in faith, amen? Brothers and sisters, it's in moments like this that the people of God need to look closer at their faith. We need to take a personal examination of ourselves at what we believe in God's ability to do. What he's going to do. That when God says he's going to do, we have to have faith that if God said it, that settles it. I'm going to believe. You need to believe in God for it. Israel did it, and look what happens. Leads me to my second point. We see the precision execution of God's battle plan. We see the precision execution of God's battle plan. We hear the divine warning and we see the collapsing wall. We hear the divine warning and we see the collapsing wall. Precision execution. Meaning... There's these people called the Blue Angels. They have this thing called precision flying. These pilots, these Navy pilots, they fly in such a way that they can't make any mistakes, that they, they move left and right, and they go up and down, they dive. It's precision execution. It's done a specific way that no one can get hurt, but everything is done right. Look at verse 15. It came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. Verse 15 shows the people of Israel being obedient to God's command. First, they got up early. Sometimes you got to rise and shine and give God some glory. Amen. You can't sleep to noon and expect to get things done. And today was that day. At the dawning of the day, they walked seven times around and on the seventh day like they were supposed to. Again, no variation, no change. They kept God's commands and followed the order strictly to the letter. But in verse 16, it came to pass on the seventh time, time around, the priest blew the trumpets and Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The time the time had come to shout. But look at the promise again. The last part of verse 16. Shout for the Lord has given you the city. Somebody should have shouted right there. Shout for the Lord has given you the city. This is the second time you see how the Lord word said the Lord has given you the city. You saw it in verse 2 and now you see it again in verse 16. Let me be clear brothers and sisters. Anytime you see something twice in scripture that's confirmation. Meaning if God said it, it's going to happen. But before Joshua had to give the people, he had to give the people a strong, strict warning about touching and handling the things they would find in the city. Look at verses 17 through 19. You see, the people were going to go in and find and see things they'd never seen before. The treasures, the precious metals, the valuable items. First thing Joshua said in verses 17 through 19, they said, Everything in that city is cursed. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all that is with her in her house. In verse 18, Joshua warns him and says, be smart. In other words, wise. Keep yourselves from the accursed things. Lest ye make yourselves accursed. Meaning, you pick up those bad things, you're going to put a curse on yourself. And here's the worst part. If you touch those things, the whole camp of Israel will have a curse and you will trouble the whole camp. Lastly, verse 19 says, bring all the silver, the gold, the vessels of brass and iron into the treasury and we're going to consecrate it meaning we're going to make it sacred to the Lord putting it in the treasury of the Lord simple directions right seems like every time God gives us simple directions to follow somebody messes it up but that's next week's sermon look at the text collapse and wall with a great shout verse 20 
So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted, the people shouted glory on this side and the people shouted hallelujah on this side. The people with a great shout said what? The people on this side said what? And the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city every man straight before them and they took the city. They acted in obedience and it was their faithful actions. There is always work for people to God to do. You have to do one thing first. The first thing is you have to believe in God that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even think. Amen? But here's the thing. God is able to do it and if we act in faith, look what they did. They walked around and then they shouted and what the walls do? The walls fell down and went boom but here's the best part look at the way the walls fell look again at the text verse 5 where it says people shall ascend up every man straight before him now look at the last part of verse 20 again the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city Brothers and sisters, archaeologists and Bible scholars agree with one thing. They all say the walls fell in such a way that there were like stepping stones leading up into the city. Almost like a ramp so that the Israelites could walk up into the city. Don't miss this. Don't miss this, please. What was a barrier, Miss Jan, something meant to keep you out was used to help you get in. Somebody should have shouted right there. God took what was meant to stop them and used it to help them get in. Hebrews 11 and 30 says, the walls, the walls, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. What walls are there in your life that you need to fall down and go boom? What are you believing in God for to do that you need to shout about? What are you having trouble with that you need to turn over to God, Mary? Do you need the Lord to knock down the walls of your life with your finances? Do you need God to knock down the walls of your debt? Do you need God to knock down the walls of your family, your children, your marriage? You need God to knock down the walls about your health, the disease, your depression, all the things that are holding you back. Keeping you from moving forward in faith. What are you trusting God in for that he needs to knock those walls down for you? If you turn it over to Jesus, he will work it out. You will see those walls in your life fall down and go boom. But first, you got to believe in God. That God can. That God will. That God will do the things he said he will. That's called faith, brothers and sisters. That's why Rahab, Abraham, Sarah, and everyone else listed in chapter 11 of Hebrews are in the hall of fame of faith. Because they acted on their faith in God. They didn't sit, but acted. The Israelites acted. They walked and then shouted. They praised. They gave God glory. What are you going to praise God for today? What are you going to shout glory to God for today? What are you going to shout hallelujah for today? What are you going to shout glory to God for today? What are you going to shout hallelujah for today? What are you going to shout glory for today? What are you going to shout for? The text doesn't tell us what word they used when the Israelites shouted. It doesn't tell us that. But if I could use my sanctified imagination, I could picture the Israelites walking around seven times. Somebody say glory on this side. But that's not going to do it. That's not going to do it. Maybe it was hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah on this side. You see, hallelujah is the highest praise. But if all the saints of God in this holy temple could lift up their voice and say his sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. Oh, that will do it. That will do it. The name of Jesus. Demons tremble in fear. At the name of Jesus, people are healed. At the name of Jesus, people come to faith. People have salvation. There's power in the name of Jesus. But let us review. We see the promised victory. 
Israel had to follow the divine directions given and take deliberate actions done in faith. We see the second point. We see the precision execution of God's battle plan. We hear the divine warning and we see the collapsing wall. Thirdly, my last point, we see the promises of God kept. The promises of God kept, resulting in the destruction complete and the dedication of valuables to God. The result is the destruction complete and dedication of valuables to God. Let's discuss the destruction complete first. In verses 21 and 24, it describes in detail the total destruction of the city of Jericho. Verse 21, they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man, woman, young, old, ox, sheep, donkey. All of these things were destroyed with the edge of the sword. And look at the first part of verse 24. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. So that's the destruction being complete, meaning everything is destroyed. Now, people always ask the question, why did God have to destroy everything and everyone? Isn't this a war crime? Hmm. Hmm. I'm glad y'all asked that question this morning. Y'all are very perceptual. It's one of the most controversial questions people ask from the Bible. Why did all the people in the promised land have to die? It's told to us in Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, and Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter. And it explains in great detail why. To sum up those verses this way, explain the actions of the Israelites in this verse. Because God didn't want the Israelites to start practicing the same idolatry and beliefs that they would become defiled with. They didn't want God to defile themselves with the wickedness of the people of the land. You see, God was trying to prevent Israel from becoming contaminated by the people in the land. You might remember when Mama might have said, I know my mama said it, if you hang around with bad people, you hang around with dogs, you might pick up some fleas. Birds of a feather flock together. So that's the same thing God was saying here in the text in Deuteronomy. If you hang around these people and leave them around, you start picking up their bad habits and doing those bad things. You see, their religious practices that these people did in this land range from human sacrifice to sexual immorality. All of these things God knew would trip up Israel. Matter of fact, Richard, that sidebar conversation we had about the spirit going in, that was one of those things that happened. Because of their curiosity leading them astray to prevent this from happening, God said, kill all the people in the land or that people could repent. Many of those people chose to be killed vice repenting. So in verses 21 and 24, we see the complete destruction of Jericho, meaning utterly destroyed all that was in that city. But look at the dedication of the valuables to God. The last part of verse 24, after the colon, only the silver, the gold, the vessels of brass, and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. The valuable precious metals of silver, gold, iron, and bronze were placed into the treasury for future use by the people of Israel for God's purpose. Not for their purpose, but for God's. But lastly, let us look at verses 22, 23, and 25. We see the promises of God kept. We serve a promise-keeping God. When God tells us to do something or tells us he's going to do something, he keeps his word. Joshua has said to the two men that had spied out the country, he told them, go to the harlot's house, bring out the woman and all that is with her. Verse 23, the young men that were spies went in and brought Rahab, her father, her mother, her brother, and all that she had, bring them to the camp of Israel. And they left and went to the camp of Israel. Verse 25, Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive. Her father's household and all that she had dwelt with Israel unto this day. Why? Here's why. 
because she hid the messengers which Joshua had sent to spy out Jericho. It was her action in faith that saved her. The way the walls of Jericho fell down inward, watch this. The walls of Jericho fell down in, inward, but Rahab's house was on the wall. Watch this. God preserved her house to remain intact while everything else around her was destroyed. Y'all ain't felt that yet. Y'all ain't felt that yet. God preserved her house. Everything around her fell down. God could do the same thing for you. God could do the same thing for you. God can do the same thing for you. God can do it. How many times it seems as if your whole world is falling down around you, that the walls of your life have fallen down and gone boom. But it was God who kept you up together like Rahab's house. When everything around her was falling apart, God kept his promise, keeping her and her family alive. And if your world is falling apart, and if everything seems like it's going and falling down and going boom, God can keep you together too. If he did it for Rahab, he can do it for you. You see, Randy, people just don't want to believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or can even think. But then, we just saw how the people of Israel believed in God and had faith enough to act on that faith by marching around obediently to have victory. You see, Margie, I, I like to go ahead and change this title of the sermon. I'm going to I'm 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 go ahead and change it. I'm going I'm to I'm go ahead and change it. Go ahead and throw it up there. Throw it up there for me, if you would, please. One more. Go before that. There you go. You've already won. You've already won. I'm going to change the title to you've already won. Why? Why? Look at verses 2 and 16 again. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho. Look at verse 16. Somebody shout right now. For the Lord have given you this city. Think about this for one second. If God tells you in his word that the victory is already yours, Yours, look at the text of the verses on the screen again. I have given you. Who said that? The Lord said it. If the Lord said it, that settles it. I heard an old story, Richard, how a Savior came from glory. How he gave up his life on Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. I heard about his groaning. I heard about his precious blood atoning. How if I repented of my sins, if we repented of our sins, we won that victory. Oh, there's victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all, all, not some, but all my love is due him. He plunged me into victory beneath the cleansing flood. You see, brothers and sisters, that's why we've already won. He's given us the victory. He's given us the victory. When he died on that cross, he's given us the victory. Death, hell, and the grave. The devil has already lost. We have victory in Jesus. Just have faith and walk into your blessings. Walk into your blessings. How many times have you seen the people in the, in the Bible have never had to raise a hand to win a fight in a battle? All they had to do was walk and with a great shout, with a great shout, with a great shout, give God glory. What are you waiting for to give God glory? What are you waiting for to give God glory? What you have already won. Give God the glory. Rise to your feet. We've already won. We have victory in Jesus. We